these. I have I have a trailer from the film that they're they're making about our band. Should we just start it out? Is it ever gonna come out? Yeah. We've been working on it for a full week. <laughs> I say we. I'm They've sorry, been no. working. No, it's cool. <laughs> They've been working on this movie for like five years. Yeah. Um, Tim Irwin, um, he's one of those guys that shoots a lot of like you know like skate videos and snowboarding videos and BMX. He um, he's the director and Keith Sharon is a producer. And these two guys were the guys that made the Minutemen documentary with Jam Connell. Yeah. So. They came to us and said, we want to make a movie about Jawbreaker, and of course, I was like, I don't know, man, I don't know if who's going to want to see that, you know? Um, but because it was them, and they, and they, you know, I saw that movie, and I was like, that, they made that movie, that's awesome. So I, I trusted them, and they came to us and said, you know, we're not going to, it's not going to be like a behind the music thing, it's not going to be like a lot of drama, it's just going to be whatever like footage that you have that you can give us, we'll throw it in there and we'll get you guys talking and find out, you know, they, took, they spoke to all of our, our nearest and dearest. And, um, but this was a process that started about five years ago. So it's taken this long because they, they both have regular jobs and families and stuff. And they just do it, you know, in the same way that, you know, we do our hobbies or something. So they just kind of attack it and then it's all go. And then they'll be, you know, six months will probably go by when they're not doing anything with it. So what they did is they they're getting close to it, a final edit, and they're going to uh, they're going to do a Kickstarter campaign to pay for the, the editor because it's it's important to pay people that are laboring on this thing, and and they put a lot of their own money into it. It's like a labor of love for them, if I could say, if I could speak for them. Um, so they're going to do a Kickstarter campaign, try to pay off the guy who's, who's cutting it together, and then hopefully it comes out or is available. And I talked to them, and they want to do it like a they want to tour it like a band. They don't want to put, they don't want to send it to festivals even. They just want to go around the country or s send it around the country to people that that are interested in showing it. And then people would show up like it's a show, yeah. and then they would just they would roll it like that. And so I have a. I have that. That's something I brought besides the paintings. I have this trailer. Should, should I roll this thing? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Abby knows more about this shit. Like, I was like, it doesn't work last night. It doesn't fucking work. Why is it not? <laughs> okay, wait. Where do I crank it? Here? Uh-oh. It already sucks. We were trying to trying to make the big time. Everyone picked up on the story of like little band sells out. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, they were obviously very ambitious, very into their little project. They're an amazing band. They're kind of tight and looseness. Oh, that just makes me like little bands. You feel like the band's yours or something like Jimmy that. Shot, well, and I think that there was a lot of that with John Ray who were like they were just like kind of fans who thought. There's clearly an internal tension in the band. Remember Blake saying, dude, I think we owe it to ourselves to stop this band right now before it gets any worse. When bands break up, it's really easy to find it kind of outrageous what we fought over and can seem ridiculous. We can't stop this band. 
I have tons of shit of ours that I have no idea what to do with. Regardless of what was going on, when it came together and worked musically, there was nothing like it. When all was said and done, punk's had the best record. He said punks knew how to do things ethically, but also kind of dangerously in a way that I think conceived of the term. So when, when, when I really felt like punk was dead, then I realized it was a good time to be part of it or claim it in a way. If the band that you're in isn't your favorite band, then you're not, you're doing something wrong. In the end, we're just trying to play good music, and I think we just locked out. You know, it's just about the state of truth, really, the awareness of being alive what that means as a human animal. He was the guy that, that signed us to the, uh, the big label, the very end, and we're still in touch with him. Um, so that's the movie, that's the trailer for the movie that I think they're going to kind of tag on the, on the Kickstarter thing and try to get some dodge that way. I know, I, I, I was conflicted about it, I was like, you, go, you hit up the very people that are going to be throwing down for this thing in the first place to finish it. And, then I thought, well, they're going to get a free copy of it. We're going to, there's going to be a ton of stuff that will, like those incentive things where we just, you know, we give, give some other, other spots. Do you know when they're going to start that? I don't. Um, like, how do you find it? Like, you know what I mean? Like, you when I, well, you know what? The, it's, I'm so lame. I'm such, I'm such a Luddite. I don't really have a website even for job. I have like a jawbreakerband.com site, but I never I haven't done anything with it yet. I just bought it. And the, the way I've just been doing it lately is on Facebook. There's a, you know, that's the only thing I can think to do. I, did, I post on there like twice, once or twice a week. That's all. That's the only kind of place where you can have a discussion about this shit. And I'll put, I'll definitely put it up on there. By the time that happens, I'll have someone who's built the website for me that'll be interactive. You can go there and buy it. Do whatever you do with your website. It'll be a blog or whatever it's called. As long as you know about it. No, it'll, it'll, it'll be, I'll, I'll try to let people know about it because I'm excited to see it. It's weird because it started, we started filming it so long ago that I think back to the interviews that I did, and I don't even, you know, I feel totally differently about some of the stuff that we talked about. So it's going to be interesting to see it, you know, you're already examining something that happened 15 or 20 years ago, but then now it's like five years later, and I, you know, I feel completely different about a lot of the stuff that we talked about. So I'm, I'm kind of dreading it a little bit. I'm kind of freaked out. <laughs> in the same way that I was freaked out that people showed up to this thing today. Um, yeah, there's Chris. What else? Oh, I got pictures. Oh, not again. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Abby's my shill. My brother's going to do some shilling right now. We're totally he not, not shill. I have not set not a setup. And I've never setup. asked this. It's, it's a setup. No, I, I actually really wanted to know. Um, who, uh, I'm serious. All right. It's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Abby's going to do his Robert De Niro impersonation for you later. No, no I want, I'm just curious. Who was your favorite producer to work with recording all your records? I've never asked you that, and I'm just curious. Like, what was the most fun experience? Well, we're, I don't know. We, we always kind of, we always took half producer credit on anything we ever did. Because we, we never knew what that meant anyway. There was the guy that was pushing the buttons and getting the levels and setting up the mics. That's I guess that's your engineer. Yeah. And then and then there were and we were calling the shots in in the mix and all that stuff. So the only person that like did I think that like produced produced us 
where you they came and did like to the practices uh-huh. and like figured out okay this is this many beats per minute and maybe we should take this part and move it like real producer type stuff mm-hmm. I think that was the only person that was that did that was was Rob Cavallo so like, at the very end but before that it was more like guys would they were recording us like in the way that Steve Albini um, in our on 24 hour revenge therapy we recorded that with Steve Albini we didn't even credit him because he didn't want to be called a producer and just as a joke we called you know we we credited his cat on the record a lot of people never even knew that Steve Albini made that record right um, that's what I was going to ask if, if he he was rad. He gave production though. He, 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 no, he, had, he had ideas and stuff. But he, he was really hand, he was hands off in that way. He had, like every once in a while I'd be like, oh maybe like this, or let's put let's try to make the biggest guitar sound with the smallest amp that we have. Right. And so we would use like you know those things you buy at Guitar Center that are like a little mini Marshall? Mm-hmm. Like that used to be we used to get have to get a, an answer. It was like a an intercom system, like you get them at Radio Shack, and they had quarter-inch inputs, and it was like a thing to make make it so you can have a speakerphone on your phone. We used to bring one of those on tour, which is basically like those little mini Marshalls. So I think we used that little tiny thing for like the biggest chorus on a 24-hour bench therapy. It's like, well, why that thing was so crazy? Russian tube mic. I think that that was one of the things we did. Blake talks about this in the movie. That was one of those Albiniisms, and he, he was like that, but it was like technical stuff, you know what I mean? He didn't mess with like your song structure, or he was like, oh, you should do a harmony here, or whatever, like that. He was always, I'm the engineer, I'm the recording, I'm recording you, that's mm-hmm. the only credit I want is to be recorded by Steve Albini. Did you feel like he just wore, he was strictly objective, or that he had any kind of aesthetic investment in what you guys are doing. Like, was he like, I don't care about your band, all I'm here for is the sound. You fired me to do a job. Yeah. That's what I'm going to do. I think it was like that. So there's no kind of like sympathetic, he was just like, give me money, I'm going to do what I That was it. That was kind of, yeah. He was really, that was, that's how he makes his living. And um, I'm sure when he's recording, you know, his favorite, like when he made the Fugazi record that never came out or whatever, he when he's recording his favorite bands, or if he's doing Jesus, Loser, Hank Boy, or whatever, I'm sure he's way more involved, but I got the impression, we were only, we were in Chicago for three days in 1993, and one of, half of one of those days, the two-track machine blew up, and we, we just lost the day completely. So I don't think that Steve Albini has any recollection of recording us. He, wait, wait, he recorded that in three days? Yeah, well, Jesus, well three days plus one more day, we did back at home with who I was going to mention next was Billy Anderson. Billy Anderson records a lot of metal bands, and he he does um, he's a really good like producer and engineer. He he did a couple of songs that we kind of screwed up in Chicago, so we re-recorded them with Billy when we got back from that that trip. And then um, and while we were in there, Blake's like, "Oh, I got this other song. Let's we should just try to do that." And that turned out to be Condition Oakland. Which would work really well because we had not, I think we didn't know it really, you know what I mean? Um, I think I'm telling the truth. <laughs> it's hard because it's been so long, and honestly, it's almost like I wasn't in that band. So sometimes when I tell a story, I'm like, is that right? Am I, or am I just making up? Am I myth making? You know what I mean? That was like, the, that's the weird thing about filming this movie, you know, like, I, I'll start talking, and I'm like, what, is that real? Like, did that happen? <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, we love myths. Yeah, I'll just lie. <laughs> I should lie. <laughs> Kim, Kim, my sister, our sister, is like, yeah, that makes, you just tell them whatever you think sounds awesome. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but producing, yeah, I, I really liked going to, um, the very first recordings we did as a band, we went to, after we made our first demo, we went to uh, Radio Tokyo. And like Radio Tokyo and Ethan James and Richard Andrews, those were names that we would see on records. And like we didn't know anything about making re- recordings. We didn't even, I don't think we even had a four track or anything. 
So we were just like, where do we go record? I don't know. But, you know, just look on the back of the record, and it says Radio Tokyo, because that's where the Minutemen were, and that's where Black Flag went that time, and that's where they made the big drill car, or whatever. And you just go there. Um, so going to Radio Tokyo was like a real thrill for us, even though it's one, it's like half the size of this, you know, and it was just a, you know, it was like just a couple blocks from where we grew up, but it was like, it was amazing. It was like this place that you saw the back of the record. Oh my God! And we were in there. We could see the graffiti on the wall, like the jokes that people made about like, getting bands and all that. Wait, and you just went there as we just booked time. Like we didn't oh, know okay. any better. We were just like, yeah, we just booked time. Like how much does it cost? The same with Al Albini. I was like shaking when I called Albini to record. I was like, because you you know that's the guy. He made all these records that we love. You call him up and you're like. He's in the phone book? Like, you can actually find him. This is crazy pretty internet, right? So, he's in the phone book, and you call him up, and, like, Steve Albini answers the phone. And I'm like, uh... You know, hey, dude, can we, uh, can, are you... You know, and then you book time, and then he's like, yeah, it's going to cost us much, and bring, bring money, and buy this kind of tape, and show up, and, like, we, you know, we pulled up to... Okay, I'm going to tell 24 hours, recording that one with Steve Albini. We pulled up. And like, like the, the guitarist from Pegboy was like, with like had a was like outside of Steve's house, like with like paint, like paint swatches, looking to see like what color he was gonna paint Steve's house. We're like, that's the guy from Pegboy, and then, and like, and then like, and then like David, yeah, like Jesus Lizard is loading out, and they're dripping sweat. They're coming from his basement and loading their shit back into their van, and while we're moving in. And like we we did we didn't want to look at the guys, you know, we were just like, oh man, there's Jesus lizard, holy shit. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, I digress. So I took some I brought some I brought some of this stuff just to throw up here. I brought some pictures from the time. If anybody has anything that they wanted to ask me, that's just okay, yeah, shout yeah. it out, because I'm, I'm totally, I'm not really prepared for this. So what are you doing music-wise now? I'm playing with um, a bunch of groups. I'm playing with my brother. I play with Rachel Hayden, who you remember from uh, That Dog and the Hayden Sisters. You LA people, you guys are all LA guys, right? Rachel's amazing. Um, I play with, I play in a country band that plays like Elks Lodges and stuff. Like a two-step country band. I just, I, it, it seemed like it'd be fun. So I do that and I play in, um, what else? I play in a, a punk band called 17 Reasons with my friend Tony. And uh, this girl, this girl Mo, Mo, who used to work, and uh, Mo used to work at the Cinefon um, up the street. And I play with uh, Abby here. So yeah, I'm still, I still play. Who asked me that? Yeah, I'm still kind of at it. Are we, and what else am I doing? There was one other we just thing. did a cool, like, a postal service kind of thing where I emailed him a number and then he gave me production notes and, you know, helped me trim the fat and then actually threw down real drums, which is a real treat because I've been using the, you know, fake drum and you just don't, you can't get a human element no matter yeah. how natural the sounds are that they have these days it just there's no human heartbeat to it. Right. so it, it's i'm just now getting i just figured out like on the first of january i was like i'm gonna go to guitar center and buy an audio interface and figure out finally how to record drums in my house because i got my drums up <coughs> in my house and play with my kids and um it sounds pretty slamming actually so now now it's cool now i play, i can do things i can like write songs with people and they send me a an email of the thing, or a Dropbox it, or whatever the hell, and then I can open it up and send it back to them. So I do, I do like that kind of long distance. So it'd be like, a, like Google unit or something to get a hold of anything like that. Or, like how do you get a hold of stuff? Well, are this, you guys recorded or like are you recording? We're, we're in the process of recording some stuff. I made a, I'm making a record with 17 reasons. It'll probably be a seven inch. Um, and you know, you know how it is now. It's yeah. like. We'll just we'll we'll press it and probably put the word out and get a put it on his website or something. The country band is just a it's literally uh, something that happens once in a blue moon and then 
it's an, it's an, it's an Elks Lodge show. We just play Elks Lodges, and we'll play like the crab feed at the Elks Lodge. You know? <laughs> it's a really great gig. They give you all the crab that you can eat, and then and then some people even dance. Like they'll get tanked up and dance a little bit. It's pretty fun. So yeah, I, I still play a little bit, but mainly I'm, a, um, I'm you know, my dad. And I have a, a business. That's but it's, I, still, I still have a toe in to the music thing. There's slideshow. Okay, so there's that. <laughs> that was in the, There's a great picture of Chris that our friend Jennifer took, and I just like this picture because uh, I don't know. I just he's making a funny one of those weird Chris chords where he's he's playing all four of them. You know what I mean? Do you? Chris played. We used to say that Chris played lead bass in in our band because he was he was really a great player. Chris is up in Olympia. He plays with a, a new band called. Um, um, it'll come to me. Um, it's not Shorebirds, it's a new thing. Mutoy Toy Band. Band, boom. Yeah, and they're great. I saw them at, at Gilman. They played a, a benefit with um, with um, Pinhead Gunpowder for for, some, for somebody, a friend of ours who was having some health problems, and, and it was great. They, sound, they were like a cross between Naked Reagan and Devo. And Chris was on stage and he was wearing a coal, like a coal miner's lantern hat with a light on the whole time. Great style. Someone wanted, this was like, this was in the art somewhere, it was like something I stole. We stole a lot of our images from places, which is, you know, probably not completely cool. But we stole that one and someone had wanted to get a tattoo of that because they thought it was kind of funny. Um, Oh yeah, Walter. We got we we're like we have a lot of cease and desists against uh, like you know that first it was Walter Matthau because we portrayed him in an unflattering light by putting him on a cover of our, one of our early seven inches and we're like yeah we're never gonna press that again and made like thousands more <laughs> not because fuck Walter Matthau we love Walter Matthau who doesn't love the Bad News Bears I watch the Bad News Bears like once a year. <laughs> if you haven't seen the Bad News Bears, just get out. <laughs> okay, here's a, here's a something I wanted to make. I wanted this to make the art. So one of these photographs from this this section, this uh, this show, uh, was in the original bivouac art. So I wanted more of that. So I had uh, all these extra pictures, including this one. Okay, that's right. So. So that's us in the smoking. There was like back in the day when you went to the school. This was Crossroads School down at 20th and, and Olympic. You could smoke in school. Can you imagine? <laughs> so that was the smoking area, and where, that's us hanging out. I wanted to show that this was. I, I made our logo. Like I, I would make a lot of our T-shirts and come up with a lot of T-shirt ideas and like some of the artwork stuff. We we all collaborated on the covers, but. Um, I did this logo and I thought it was, I, this was back in the day when there was, we didn't have computers and stuff, so you would do, like when you made a flyer, you would go to the art store and buy the, um, the Letra set that you would press. Do you know those sheets? They're like these plastic sheets with all the lettering, and then you would put them on the page and kind of rub it off and then it would stick to the, does anyone know what I'm talking about? It's Letra set. They don't even make it anymore. And this is a, I don't know. That's so. That's like was my original idea, and then the idea was to make it just a little bit wrong, so it didn't look too cool. A little bit rough around the edges, and maybe a little bit broken in that part. So I did that. That's my work. That's my work right there. Uh, you know, that's like something we found in a dumpster, and we're like, I know what we could do. We'll take the transparency that we burnt the t-shirt screen with and we'll put it on top of the thing and then that's a light show. <laughs> that's like a pyrotechnic light show. Um, and when we were around the time of Bivouac, after we made Bivouac, we went on a tour of the states and we drove across the states from SF to New York and then we flew to our first uh, European tour from New York. So it was a big long tour to get across, and then we jumped over and played a long time over there, and then flew back to New York and played back across. It was a really long one, and um, somewhere over there, I got the, I got this idea. I just like 
I thought it would be cool to bite that image because it's, it's charming. And then just flip the, the saying, and then there's our most popular teacher. Um, yeah, and I think they have them here. Oh, and there's Kurt, okay, there's Kurt Cobain. I put this in there because he's wearing the Jawbreaker t-shirt, and I'd never seen this picture until really recently. But there's Kurt wearing that t-shirt that I was just talking about. Um, when we, we played, we toured with Nirvana in 1993. So this, I'm jumping forward a little bit. I, I wanted to keep it around 91 with all the images and stuff and whatever kind of st stupid stories, but obviously I'm, I'm going way off here. But we toured with them. We took a lot of shit for that from the hardcore uh, punk, like the MRR kind of punk rock people because they were like, they're corporate and everything, and we were like, fuck that, they're an awesome band, we're going on tour with them a lot, I don't care what happens. So, um, we, we were thrilled to do that, and I think we gave him a shirt, and then there he is, there he is wearing it. But when we first, I was just telling Abby this story, um, or someone the other night, last night, um, when we first met Kurt, he, he, uh, he came to sort of meet us when we met him in Albuquerque. And he came backstage and he's, he went to Blake and he kind of, he's very kind of quiet, soft-spoken, and he said, hey, I just got a, uh, he was telling him, I just got a, a, new, a new guitar. It's a, it's a Fender Jaguar and a Fender Mustang, like, mashed together. It's a Jag saying. And that's what I'm playing. Do you want to check this out? That was like his way of like bringing, you know, being nice and inviting to Blake or whatever. Blake's like, yeah, I got this, uh, I just got this left hand. He's talking about his Les Paul or something that he just got. And Kurt said to Blake, and I'll never forget it, he said to Blake, you know, I too am left handed. <laughs> <laughs> Which was an interesting way of saying it. I too am left handed. <laughs> But like, as if, as if we didn't know that Kurt Cobain was left-handed. Like, at the time, if you shot a gun in the air, the bullet would land on a video of Nirvana playing wherever you were. You know what I mean? So, I always thought that was pretty charming, that he would assume that Blake might not know that, that he was left-handed. That's, uh, this is back when it was, this is coming back, too. This is back when it's, you had the shirtless drummer. <laughs> it's starting to come back. I've seen it a couple places. I think Blake is now playing with a shirtless drummer, I believe. Kevin? And it was because, really, it was because you didn't, you had this many clothes and you didn't, you would just make your shirt wet and then you'd be, you'd have to wash your shirt. I think, is that it? Yeah, that's, that's it. That's all, that's all I got. Uh, has any any questions or whatever? Fire away, and if not, certainly if you had something that wasn't public domain that you want to ask about, or want to dish on something with me, you can. You're you're welcome to to stick around. I'll be here for a little bit longer. Thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah. I